Uh, Mr. President, I uh, ask for unanimous consent to speak as though we're in morning business. Without objection. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, I rise uh, this afternoon to speak against this so-called Buffett rule. Uh, Mr. President, this is a gimmick. It's a political gimmick. This is not a serious effort to deal with a ridiculously broken tax code. This is not a serious effort to deal with a completely broken budget. And frankly, it's very disappointing to me that we're wasting time on this instead of dealing with both of those things. We have a tax code that is ridiculous, impossible to understand, counterproductive to economic growth, badly needs a complete overhaul that would simplify this code, get rid of the many unfairnesses, lower marginal rates, broaden the base, and encourage strong economic growth. Instead, we've got this little gimmick because we don't have the political leadership to deal with the underlying real problem of a badly flawed tax code. Likewise, on budget policy, this does nothing meaningful for our massive budget deficits that we've been running. In fact, this body chooses again for the third consecutive year not to even have a budget. It's unbelievable. Instead, we're going to waste time arguing about this uh, political stunt. Now, the president proposed a budget, at least. Unfortunately, it was not a serious budget not a serious attempt to deal with the massive deficits we're running. It's a fourth consecutive year of trillion dollar deficits. And uh, instead of dealing with that, we have this, this gimmick. So let's be clear. This is not a serious attempt to deal with tax reform or the budget. This uh, so-called Buffett rule, this tax increase, would raise less than $5 billion a year. That amounts to about half of 1% of the trillion dollar deficit that the president has proposed that we run. In fact, it would cover about two days worth of the deficits that we're running for 2013. Here's a, a chart that illustrates the deficit that we'll have under the president's policies without the Buffett tax. Here's the deficit we'll have if we pass the Buffett tax. If you can't tell the difference, it's because there is no meaningful difference. Folks, we ought to be dealing with the real tax reform that we need to encourage economic growth and help reduce this deficit. Instead, we're wasting time with this. So since we're not doing what we ought to do, why, why are we having this argument? Unfortunately, it looks like it's an effort on two fronts. One is to simply engage in class warfare, generate envy and resentment, and try to use that for political gain. And secondly, it's an effort to distract from the underlying mismanagement of economic policy and fiscal policy that we have seen from this administration. Now, I know what the claim is from the other side. We hear that this is all about making sure that the rich pay their fair share. I have to say I have a little bit of trouble taking lectures on fairness from folks who think that taxpayers ought to be made to put $500 million into a solar energy company that does not have a competitive product, which drives it into bankruptcy at the cost to the taxpayers from the same folks that want to force taxpayers to continue subsidizing plug-in cars that people don't want to buy, that kind of crony capitalism and distorting of our economy at the expense of taxpayers doesn't strike me as fairness. So I have a hard time taking a lecture on fairness from people who advocate those things. But let's look at this tax code. If we want to talk about fairness, that's fine. How about the fact that according to the Joint Committee on Taxation, Almost half of all Americans today pay no income tax at all or actually receive money through the income tax code. The other half pay all of the taxes, and we're hearing from our friends that that's not enough. They need to pay still more. According to the CBO, and my second chart will uh, illustrate this point, according to the CBO, if we look at all federal taxes, the middle quintile, the middle 20% of wage earners in America, pay about 14% as an average tax when you combine all the kinds of federal taxes that are paid. Top 1% pay 30%. So more than, more than twice as high, 29.5 actually. If we look at just the income tax, the disparity is even bigger. If we look at the income tax alone, the middle quintile, the middle class, the middle 20% when it comes to income tax alone, on average, pay about 3.3% as an effective average income tax rate. The top 1% pay 19%, so on average, almost six times as high 
The fact is we have a very progressive tax system, not just by the historical measures of our own previous tax systems, but look everywhere else in the world. In fact, the United States, according to the OECD, the U.S., has the most progressive tax system in the industrialized world. Turn this one on its side. And this is a chart that measures progressivity. Greater progressivity is in this direction, less is in this direction. As you can see, this ranking shows all of the countries in the OECD, all countries around the world, that have less progressivity than the United States does, which means that higher income Americans pay a greater share of income taxes and taxes generally than in any other country in the world. But again, we're told this is not enough. Clearly, there's something else going on here. Here's what concerns me the most. The real consequences of this so-called Buffett rule, this tax increase, is that it is meant to be a tax on investment returns. It's a tax on capital gains and dividends. It's a tax that would upend decades of established law with respect to the differentiation that we have put in place with respect to dividend income versus wage income. And it disregards the very sound reasons why we have created that distinction. One of which is that investment returns are taxed multiple times. We don't hear so much about that during this debate uh, from my friends who are advocates for this new tax, this tax increase. But the fact is, first of all, it's only after act tax income that can be invested in the first place. So someone had to pay taxes on their earnings. And then after they've spent what they need to for their, for their uh, cost of living, and if they've managed to save something which they then invest, they've already paid tax on that. So now, the investment that they've made, and let's say this is in the investment in a, a corporate stock, let's keep in mind that that corporation has to pay tax before they have an opportunity to return, to provide a return on the investment that's made. And as it happens in the United States, our corporations pay the highest corporate tax in the entire industrialized world, 35%. Uh, we've got a terrible corporate tax code. It needs to be reformed in many ways. One of them is to lower this top marginal rate, but right now it's 35%. And what the proponents of this rule are saying is that after a corporation pays that 35% tax on whatever income they can earn, and when they then choose to dividend some of that remaining after-tax income to the people who own that company, they want those owners to pay yet another tax that is even higher than what we pay now. We've got a chart here that illustrates what the net effect of this is. Given that we have a 35% top corporate tax rate, and if we were to adopt this proposal to impose this 30% minimum tax, for an individual who has dividend income, first, the company in which they invest pays a tax. Now, not all companies pay at the 35% rate, but that is the top rate, and it is in effect on many companies. Well, if the company has to pay 35% of a given $100 of income, they're left with $65 in after corporate tax income. And if that company then decides that the people who own it ought to get a dividend reflecting their ownership, on that $65 that is available to be paid out as a dividend to investors, the proponents of the Buffett rule would have those investors pay another 30%. Well, that's $19.50, leaving the investors with $45.5 out of the $100 of income. In other words, the government takes the lion's share of the income from this investment. The net effect of that, of course, is it diminishes the incentive to make these investments in the first place. It makes other countries more attractive places to invest capital, to invest in a business, to try to generate a return. There's another aspect that's disturbing about this, which is, if you ask me, it's very reminiscent of the alternative minimum tax. Right? We tried that once. In 1969, uh, Congress decided that there were some people that just weren't paying enough in tax, and they said, we're just going to target just a handful. Literally, there's 155 people who were, that's it. Not 155,000, 155 people who were subject to the alternative minimum tax, which was this confession of the absurdity of the tax code in the first place, right? Junk the entire existing tax code and have yet a second parallel code that will apply to just those rich 155 people. Well, guess what? 
Today, that applies to tens of millions of Americans, and every year, Congress has to do a temporary fix because it wasn't intended to do that. Well, Mr. President, I would suggest if we go down this road, we're going to find that this tax, which we're told today, would only apply to millionaires and billionaires. Well, pretty soon, the hard, cold reality of the fact that it doesn't generate any revenue to speak of if you apply it just to millionaires and billionaires means it's going to be expanded to the middle class and far more people, very much to our detriment. Finally, let me say that it's just a bad idea to confiscate the capital which is the lifeblood of an economy. This next chart illustrates the critical role that investment plays in economic growth and in job creation. Um, a couple of squiggly lines, but one thing you notice if you just sort of take a quick look, there's a, uh, an inverse relationship here, right? When the black line goes up, the red line's going down. The black line is investment as a percentage of our economy. And when investment climbs, the red line is unemployment. You see unemployment goes down. This is very, very well understood. It's capital invested in the economy that creates growth, creates jobs. And what this rule would do, it would impose a new layer of additionally higher taxes on that very lifeblood of our economy. It's capital also that drives wages higher. We should never forget that fact. It's capital that allows the hunter-gatherer to have a hoe and become a farmer. It's capital that allows the farmer with the hoe to cast aside the hoe and drive a tractor and become far more productive. It's capital that allows the laborer who's digging with the shovel to put aside the shovel and drive a backhoe. And as I think everybody understands or should understand, the farmer who's using a tractor is producing more and has a higher income than the poor guy who's using a hoe. And the guy who's operating a backhoe has far more income and is far more productive than the guy who's using a shovel. It's capital that makes that possible. There's a, uh, a metaphor that I like about this, and I, I'm not sure who to credit it to. It's certainly I didn't invent it. Um, and I may not do it justice, but the gist of it is this. It's a, it's a comparison to the economy is that of a fruit tree. A farmer who has a fruit tree cultivates that tree so that it will produce fruit, and the fruit is the income that the farmer earns from the work he puts into cultivating the tree. Now, if the government comes along and takes some of the fruit as a tax, as long as it doesn't take too much, it still makes sense for the farmer to cultivate that tree so that he can have that after-tax income. And as long as the government only takes a portion of the fruit, then the government's not diminishing the ability of the tree to produce that fruit. But if the government comes along and says, in addition to taking a whole lot of the fruit, we want to saw off a branch because we'd like some firewood. Well, now that's a whole different matter because whatever you think of how much of that, those apples or whatever the, uh, portion of that fruit you'd like to take from the farmer, once you start cutting at the tree, you're diminishing the ability of the tree to produce income for the good of the farmer and for society. That's what happens when we restrict capital. And that's what I'm afraid we're, this is the, the path that we'd be going down if we adopt this. This is bad economic policy. We already have the most progressive tax code in the world and very progressive by our own historical standards. Uh, Mr. President, for the sake of job growth, economic growth, and, a, uh, and in the hopes that we will instead have a meaningful discussion about budget policy and tax reform, I urge my colleagues to vote no today on the cloture motion on the Buffett rule, and I yield the floor.